Um, I'd like to welcome and introduce to you Dr. Sharon Jacob. She is um, currently Assistant Professor of New Testament at Phillips Theological Seminary. She received her um, PhD in 2013 from Drew University, um, Graduate Division of Religion, and her um, Master of Sacred Theology in 2005 from Yale Divinity School, and um, Bachelor of Commerce from 1999 uh, from Bangalore University. And she has taught as a visiting assistant professor of religion at Luther College prior to going to Phillips. Her publication, um, Reading Mary Alongside Indian Surrogate Mothers, Violent Love, Oppressive Liberation, and Infancy Narratives, came out last year, 2015, from Paul Gray. And um, she has forthcoming publications, which sound really interesting here, um, Flowing from Breast to Breast, an Examination of Displaced Motherhood in Black and Indian Wet Nurses, in Women's Biblical Interpretation, Expanding the Discourse uh, from Society of Biblical Literature. And another um, chapter, Facing the Nations, Becoming a Majority Empire of God, Reterritorialization, Language, and Imperial Racism in Revelation 7, 9 through 17. In Early Christianity, uh, Walter ben Benjamin, Gilles Deleuze, and Alain Badu, and Judith Butler from Equinox Publishing. Um, she is on the um, Committee for Feminist Hermeneutics of the Bible and a board member of Feminist Studies and Religion. Please help me welcome Dr. Sharon Jacob. Dr. Ann Gill for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to share my work with you. Uh, <clears throat> as most of you know, uh, doing your PhD studies is a very lonely and isolating process. And it's just you having conversations with these texts. And when that publication happens and you bring it out into the world, it's always interesting and exciting to see the kind of reaction you get for your work. So I'm very grateful to Dr. Anjo um, and to all of you for giving me this opportunity. <clears throat> I am nursing a, a really bad cold, so um, you, I have a mint in my mouth so I can get through the presentation without uh, going into a hysterical cough split. But, um, so my presentation today is going to talk about uh, Mary uh, in a post-colonial India. In my book, I talk about the history of uh, surrogacy and wet nursing in colonial India, but because of the lack of time that we have over here, I'm going to be talking only on uh, the post-colonial India and the surrogacy industry in the post-colonial India. When it opens up to Q&A, if any of you have questions about it, I'm more than happy to engage with you and talk with you about some of the work that I've done there. Just to give you a quick preview of what I'm going to be talking about, we'll, we'll start off by watching a short, short, very short clip um, <clears throat> on what, surrogacy in, what the surrogacy industry is and uh, how it is going about uh, conducting its business in India. We will then talk about the way critics of the surrogacy industry have talked about these mothers. We will then talk about the way in which Mary has been talked about in biblical scholarship. And um, we will talk about some of the connections between these two women, the issue of consent, whether the choice that both Mary and the Indian surrogate mother make uh, is an economical choice, and also talk about language and prosperity, and we'll end with why Mary's maternal performance must be seen as um, violent love and an oppressive liberation versus just an oppressed um, maternal subjectivity or a liberated maternal subjectivity. <clears throat> so to bring the video in. Each one was born from a surrogate mother in India. Mothers like 26-year-old Opina, who just carried and gave birth to twins, for Christine, an infertile <coughs> woman from Vancouver, Canada. Opina was able to buy a home 
after renting out her womb for $7,500. That's more than 10 <coughs> years' wages in India. She is one of 50 active surrogates who live here at the Akanksha Infertility Clinic in Anand Gujarat. As a whole, the surrogacy team have about three babies every month. Each surrogate is surgically implanted with the client's embryo, which they carry under contract <coughs> until delivery. In India, this growing industry is estimated at $445 billion. Hundreds of Westerners sign up each year to hire a surrogate for five times less than what it would cost back home. Christine, who didn't want her surname used, tried in vitro fertilization first, transferring her fertilized egg to her own uterus. No success. India was her last hope, since commercial surrogacy, the acceptance of money to carry another's child, is outlawed in Canada. I think there's an industry out there that's very complicated, the whole fertility industry, and I think there needs to be op more openness towards surrogacy as an option instead of continual repeat visits and an encouragement for IVF cycles to continue. Here is a young couple, the lady who is born without a uterus. It's not her fault. It's God's gift to her. And for her to make her life comfortable, to make her suffering less, if she wants a child of her own, from her own genes, and if there's another lady who is ready to help her, do the same thing, okay, to have a baby. Why should it be a problem for anyone? Dr. Nina Patel started the clinic five years ago. She requires surrogates to already have their own children and limits each to three tries. She cringes at anyone who calls this exploitative. As soon as you come to a poor country, you say that it's exploitation. I know what it means to a surrogate, the compensation that she gets, what it means to her life, what life they were living before, and now how it has changed their lives. The rules are more lax in India. Dr. Patel implants up to five embryos in a surrogate to ensure success, meaning quintuplets are a possibility. In Britain, the maximum is two. This explains the high incidence of twins at the clinic. Dr. Patel says the surrogates are undeterred, even if they risk greater physical strain from multiple births. 42-year-old New Yorker Heidi, who didn't want her surname used, watches a ceremony for a Japanese man's new baby, born to an Indian surrogate. This is Heidi's second try in India. Her first surrogate suffered a miscarriage. India is most affordable for her, but her primary reason for coming here is legal. Different states have different laws. My in New York, um, the contract is not binding. So even beyond going through all the paperwork, if the surrogate decided she wanted to keep the baby, the contract is null and void. It's, you know, she has all the rights. Indian surrogates have no legal right to the child after delivery. Many surrogates here admit the hardest part is giving the babies away after childbirth. Soon, Opina's only memory of the twins she held for nine months will be this locket. <clears throat> so let's take a moment to just sink in what we just saw. <clears throat> the Indian surrogate industry currently is estimated to be worth $2.3 billion a year. It's a growing industry. This is a print ad that we see. Um, to hire Indian surrogates or to uh, get couples globally to come in and invest in this business. It says right there, are you married and want a baby? But the same sexedness of your relationship puts you at a disadvantage. The real roadblocks are the expense and time required for the surrogacy process. The answer lies overseas. Affordable Indian surrogates, let them carry that for you. Here you see that maternal labor now entering into a global market 
takes on a different dimension. And <clears throat> the image of a third world woman who's carrying uh, labor to go and build buildings is now entering into the market to become a mother to another. Critics who are um, against the, the surrogacy industry often will argue that surrogacy in India is about cheap labor and cheap wombs. Let's be honest, it's about exchange rates, folks. In the United States, it's going to cost you fifty to $70,000 to hire a surrogate, while as in India, you would get a surrogate from start to end between $7,500, maximum maybe $15,000. They also argue that this industry preys on racially and economically inferior women who perform maternal labor at a cheap cost. At one point of time, we were talking about um, sending our labor overseas where women, th well, third world women were making shoes and clothes at a cheaper labor, uh, at a cheaper cost. And now we're talking about third world women carrying children at for a cheaper price. They also argue that the doctor and the infertile couple greatly benefit from the surrogate mother's contribution. Uh, the surrogate mother is often taking risks, uh, as you heard in, in, the, in the clip itself. Up to five embryos are uh, inserted into a woman, uh, and that means greater, uh, greater uh, chances of having twins, but that also means greater risk to the mother's life. On the other hand, you have people who champion this business, who make the argument that surrogacy is a business that's run by women for women. And uh, it's kind of constructed as this global sisterhood. They also make the argument that the women are making their own choice about their own body. And so therefore, it must be seen as an industry that empowers women. After all, these are women who are consenting to become mothers to others. They're not coerced in any way. And they also make the argument that it's a win-win situation for all, just like how you heard the doctor say it, Dr. Nana Patel. Uh, the commissioning couples get a child. The, in the, uh, the, uh, the surrogate mother gets um, money. And the doctor is happy in, in, her, in and of itself. So she's just bringing these two parties and together and, make it, and allowing for a context in which they're helping each other out. So, <clears throat> how can we talk about post-colonial surrogacy and not talk about Oprah, right? So, Oprah Winfrey in 2007 declared in front of 8 million viewers that Indian surrogacy was about women helping women. And Rituja, who is a, who is a real life surrogate mother, says, it's true I'm doing this for the money, but is it also not true that a childless couple is benefiting? On the other hand, you have critics like Deborah Spar, who has written on the ways in which surrogacy is exploitative, who makes the same, who makes the argument that if there is a demand in one part of the world, and there is, and a lower priced supply in another, and there is, that the record for trade in general and reproduction in particular suggests that commerce will happen or will proceed. It is the relationship between demand and supply. On the other hand, you have Salma, who is one of the surrogate mothers, who says that she's, she is becoming a surrogate because it is a compulsion. It's a majburi. Uh, before she went in to become a surrogate, they did not have clothes to wear. Uh, their, the roof of their house collapsed. And now, with the help of surrogacy, she is now able to buy a house and educate her children. So that's what critics say about <clears throat> the post-colonial surrogacy business and the post-colonial Indian surrogate mother. Let's turn our attention just for a slight bit uh, to look at the, uh, the Gospel of Luke. Luke 138, and here I'm going to call on Mr. Tawar to help me out. Could you read that uh, biblical text for me, Tawar? Thank you, Tawar. Um, the way in which this particular phrase has been dealt with by scholars and theologians is that they too dichotomize 
the action of Mary into two categories. Mary, those scholars who agree that Mary is a hero, make the argument that she is a subversive mother, she's a consenting mother, and therefore she is an active mother. On the other hand, those scholars who make the argument that Mary is a victim of exploitation say she is a submissive mother, she is a coerced mother, and she is a passive mother. To give you an idea, here are two, um, two quotes that biblical scholars have used to understand the actions of Mary. Mary Foskett says, the narration of her response unparalleled in biblical birth narrative serves to convey an agency that counters the representation of Mary as vulnerable object. Although no response is sought by the angel, Mary makes a choice in a situation where none is demanded. By offering her consent, the virgin asserts her own voice into the scene. I agree with Foskett on this. Yes, Mary is a consenting mother. She is active and in a context where women were silent and their voice is not heard, Mary makes a choice about her body. On the other hand, I also agree with scholars like Jane Schaber, who make the argument that Mary's response in chapter 138, her characterization of herself as the servant, the correct translation for that is, comes from the Greek word doule, which is slave, where she says, here I am, the slave of the Lord, can be most responsible for understanding of her by some as a passive, colorless character, the antithesis of a liberated woman. And I agree with Sheberg too. Yes, she is passive. But can she be active and passive at the same time, oppressed and liberated at the same time? I wonder. This is a painting by Raphael Sawyer in 1980, and it is called The Annunciation. He takes the story of Luke's gospel and places it in a contemporary context. And in doing so, he constructs it in a very ambivalent light. Something similar that I plan on doing in this presentation and I have done in my book. I make an argument that Mary is a different mother. So far, we have seen that Mary's choice or Mary's consent is constructed and interpreted through a dichotomous lens where her choice is seen by some as heroic and others by vic as victimization. But if we were to step back from this conversation and take a moment and deepen the way in which we understand Mary's choice and contextualize her consent in the text and read it through the real life experiences of these Indian surrogate mothers, would something change? When we interpret her choice through the lens of globalization and capitalism, a reality that we're living in today, what happens? Does her consent, does her motherhood become more ambivalent? Does her consent become more complex? And does her sub subjectivity become closer to the reality of the lives in which these Indian surrogate mothers are living in? So I make the argument that Mary is a different mother. She makes a choice, but it's an ambivalent choice. Yes, she is liberated, but her liberation actively comes from her own willingness to exploit herself and a desire for liberation and hope for her people and herself. And ultimately, the maternal love that she performs for the child of another is a love that is both violent and loving it is oppressed and it's liberating at the same time. And also, she is never either or of the categories. So <clears throat> let's be honest, there are differences between Mary and the Indian surrogate. And let's just name out the differences right out there. First of all, the Indian surrogate women are real life women. They're living and working in a post-colonial India. Mary is a literary character that is written in, uh, in the infancy narratives, we have no evidence of whether she was a historical figure or not. In addition to that, there is a bigger significant difference, the elephant in the room, as you say, and we should just name it. Uh, first is that Mary, we are told in the Gospels, uh, never knew a man. She was a virgin. Um, and so that, uh, and, and that's a huge difference. 
On the other hand, the Indian surrogate mothers are women who are married and have had children, or at least a child. In fact, the only way for you to become a surrogate in India is to be married and to have a child, because the doctors believe then it is easier for you to give up the child. Clearly, they haven't met many women. Same, right? But there is, that's the superficial difference. When you enter into a deeper understanding of these two women, you see that there are some connections. The first and the foremost connection is that both these women conceive without a physical male. Their willingness, their consent, and their choice is tied into their desire for a maternal hope. And they exploit the system as much as they, the system exploits them. These are not passive victims. They are also women with agency. They are also impregnated by third parties. Third parties that hail from a higher and a superior realm, whether it is economic or divine. We cannot start talking about Mary without talking about Joseph. And here I'll ask Tawar to read uh, the passage that is right in front of you, Matthew 1, 20 to 24. When you hear the words of uh, the text of Matthew through the lens of what Gori, who is a surrogate mother, tells a reporter, it really makes us want to question Joseph's immediate willingness to take Mary as his wife. Gori, who is a surrogate mother, says, the only thing they, that is the surrogate clinic, told me was that this thing is not immoral, I will not have to sleep with anyone, and that the seed will be transferred into me with an injection. They also said I have to keep the child inside me, rest the whole time, take medicines on time, and give up the child. The consent forms in the surrogate industry, as Rengachari Smirden uh, points out, are very, very short. In addition, most of the consent forms are also written in English. Most of the women who are signing up to be surrogates are uneducated. In, ad in addition to all this, a woman cannot become a surrogate until unless her husband, especially if she's married and her husband is living, does not sign on the consent form. The consent of the man is very important for this transaction to take place. In her article entitled No Country for Young Women, Ratna Kapoor states, sex and intimacy are cast as negative, degrading, and indecent something from which the good, decent Indian woman ought to be protected. The protectionism comes from a sex phobia that ensures sex remains in the closet, and any claims for sexual rights become bizarrely associated with something Western, decadent, hedonistic, or deviant. In such a patriarchal society, how are we to explain the sudden cooperation or the sudden liberal-mindedness of not just the Indian husband, but also Joseph, right? Both these men are willing to accept their women or willing to allow their women to become mothers to other when they are assured that their women will not have to sleep with someone. Uh, <clears throat> that, their, that the sexual chastity of their wives will be intact. If you notice in your text in Matthew, Joseph only says yes after he is told that she is carrying the child of, um, from the Holy Spirit. In the same way, the, India, the husband of the Indian surrogate woman allows his wife to become a mother to another when he is told that she does not have to sleep with anybody, but in fact she is being penetrated with a needle rather than the physical you-know-what. More importantly, the male consent is also given once they realize that the decision to allow their wives or fiancé to become a mother to the other is intimately tied with their people, the future of their people or their family. Notice again in the Gospel of Matthew, Joseph says yes when, when he is told 
that the child that Mary is going to bear is going to save his people from their sins. There is a material hope that is being realized in front of Joseph's, Joseph's eyes before he gives his consent. And it's very similar to what happens in the modern context of the, the surrogacy industry where the Indian man will say yes to his wife becoming a mother to another to transgressing willingly the marital patriarchal laws when he is assured that the money she is going to bring into the family will help run his business. So how are we supposed to read Joseph's willing ob uh, uh, obedience? Maybe we need to pause and think about it a little bit more deeply. We need to understand Joseph's consent in a way that is more ambivalent and complex. <clears throat> Let's talk about Mary now. And for Mary, we will talk mostly in the Gospel of Luke and um, to our the next verse, please. Thank you. Thank you. If you notice, again, Mary says yes only after she is told this. And I don't know about you, but that sounds like a pretty sweet deal. It's a promise that is being given to me that the child I'm going to carry is going to become the ancestor of David. It also tells me that if I make this sacrifice, the future of my people and my own future will be changed forever. Mary and the Indian surrogate mothers are, are different in the sense that the surrogate mother gets a monetary compensation. Najima Vora tells, tells her reporter that the money she gets from the surrogacy industry, she, uh, from being a surrogate, she is going to divide that into three ways. First, she is going to buy herself a brick house. Second, she is going to invest in her husband's business. And third, she is going to educate her children. So, and she also says, my daughter wants to be a teacher. I'll do anything to give her that opportunity. But what really connects these two women is that they are given hope. They are given a hope and they're given and they're seduced with the idea that life could be different. And when that hope is realized for them, they eagerly seek out to become mothers to others. When reading Mary's eagerness to please God and her open obedience, we must do that reading with some caution. I will argue that Mary's willingness to read through the lens of surrogacy is performative of an obedience, but an obedience that is resistant in a way. What she is demonstrating in the Gospel of Luke is a kind of love for the other, but it's a love that is also violent. It demonstrates also the way in which power, whether it's economic or divine, inflicts violence and exploits bodies of economically inferior women by seducing them with hopes of a better future. And therefore, this hope is so much more than what they already have in their lives that they're willing to consent to their own exploitation. In addition, one of the reasons why the surrogate industry is such a success in India is that it is able to recreate a virginal conception that at once fulfills the patriarchal requirements. It protects a sexual woman's honor and at the same time allows them to transgress marital boundaries and opens her body up to foreign penetration. It illustrates the delicate balance between capitalism and patriarchy and this is an invaluable formula to help in the success of commercial surrogacy in India. In addition to this, many reporters talk about why in Indian women are important um, Indian women are so desirable as surrogates is because the Indian society is conservative. Indian women are not known to have promiscuous sex or smoke and drink. And so therefore, couples from the Western part of the world prefer India because they at least know that their child is in safe hands and there will be no other diseases. These women are temporary mothers. And if we look at Luke chapter 2, 15 through 19, 
it says, you notice with Luke's gospel um, that Luke tends to really put Mary in a very active role right at the beginning and then slowly silences her out. Turret Carlson Syam, who's a biblical scholar, writes, through the transference of Mary's maternal relationship from the physical family to the fictive family of God, the possibility of an alternative, mother, alternative motherhood is opened up. And it is no longer limited to her, but is given to all women who hear God's word and do it. I would argue that through the use of surrogacy industry, there is an alternative motherhood that opens up too, where all of a sudden, the brown body of the surrogate mother gets absorbed into the white Western family. Just like Mary's body is absorbed into the divine family of the Hebrew God. This is a new kind of family, post-colonial in its own sense, where physical distinctions such as race, class, caste, economy are all breaking down. And yet, these women are never allowed to claim ownership with, uh, of their own children. I must tell you, when I was doing research, I came across a lot of interviews with these women who talked about uh, the, the commissioning couples sending the surrogate mothers food and care packages. And oftentimes, they would send uh, beef and ham uh, without realizing that these women were vegetarian. And so it would be given to the, either the Christian or the Muslim uh, staff in the, in the, in the hospitals. Uh, in addition to that, there is also this sense of, you know, they really care for us. One of the surrogate mothers, uh, and, I, and I mentioned it in my book, talks about how, you know, this woman comes in and hugs her and she feels so awkward because she has been a low caste all her, all her life. And she, this affection that she gets from this commissioning parent, a, a mother, she finds as, you know, liberating at the same time. And you're, and you're left to really ask yourself the question, but do you realize that the reason they're hugging you is because of the child and not because it's you, right? And the, it, it, is, it is just such a complex way to understand emotions. In addition, there is a lot of the surrogates, and you, and you heard that even on the tape, who say oh, they will only talk about the experience of giving up the child when they're really pressed by the reporters. Um, Surrogate Bora says to Abigail Hayworth, um, if I do feel sad after the birth, I will not show it. I can understand how much Jessica wants this baby, and in India, infertility is considered a curse. Indian women also sign up to become surrogates to a Western couple, not just because it's a money, but because they recognize that to be an infertile woman in India, to be a barren woman in India, is, is that God has not looked upon you with favor, right? And so they will talk about being a surrogate as something that they are really blessed to do. And they're also hired by people who tell them that they're doing God's work. <clears throat> in Luke chapter 2, 49, the Luke and Jesus tells, um, tells Mary, why are you searching for me? And he reproves his mother. Do you not know that I must be in my father's house or about my father's business? In toys to patrus mu. Similar to, to Mary in the Lucan text, whose true feelings about the child that she was, she, has, she was chosen to carry are narratively silenced, the Indian surrogate mothers will only express their true feelings after much persuasion from the reporters. They acknowledge their sadness as they feel at parting with the child that they are being paid to carry. And they're aware of their temporal positions by becoming mothers to other. In the end, you don't even hear a dialogue from Mary in the Luke's Gospel. And neither do you hear about these surrogate women once the child is given birth to and paid for. The decision that both Mary and the Indian surrogate mothers make is a conscious one. And let's not kid ourselves. Like Mary says, here I am. It's a decision that she makes about her body. Luke chapter 1, 46 through 48 says, <clears throat> In the Magnificat, 
Mary refers to herself explicitly as a low, lowly servant. But at the same time, she also calls herself blessed. And in doing that rhetorical move, she, um, her, her status is made as an exceptional person and an exclusive person. Surrogate mother named Vidya says, I am doing this basically for my children's education and my daughter's marriage. I am not greedy for the money. This surrogacy is like God has blessed me and given me the opportunity to do something for them, meaning the commissioning parents. Both Mary and surrogate Vidya explicitly state that they are blessed women because they have been chosen by the powerful other to become womb mothers to children belonging to or from a higher realm. And at the same time, the, reading their choice in the context, in a full context, illustrates that their choice is strongly tied into hope, a material hope, and a desire for a better future for their people and their children. So how then must we understand the consent of these women? Is it an unconditional consent? Or rather, is it a political choice that they are making uh, that is conditional and hopeful for the future of their people? I really uh, love this quote by Manju, who's a surrogate. She was approached a month ago by a representative of a, a surrogacy clinic in the northern state, state of Haryana, who was looking to hire and recruit surrogate mothers. And she tells the reporter, you know, matter-of-factly, that she may just take, take up the offer. And she says it's good money. And when the reporter asks uh, Manju if there are going to be any risks and is she not worried about it, she says, risks? What risks? Any fool can have a baby. It takes a smart woman to get paid for it. Right? These women are undeterred. But why are they undeterred? Is it because they have nothing to lose? When we talk about surrogacy and the surrogacy industry, we cannot not talk about race. It has been more than 60 years since India received her independence from the British Empire. However, the remnants of a colonial identity continues to influence the construction of the Indian subject in a post-colonial India. As a result, discussions surrounding the reproductive tourism industry in India would remain incomplete and inaccurate without the insertion of race in the issue of surrogacy. After all, these are women who are racially and economically inferior, who are serving as gestation sites for couples with more money. One of the theorists that I use uh, who does work on critical race theory, Kalpana Shishadri Crooks, argues whiteness which founds the logic of racial difference, promises wholeness. This is what it means to desire whiteness, not to become Caucasian. But, to put it redundantly, it is an insatiable desire on, on the part of all race subjects to overcome difference. Whiteness, whiteness attempts to signify being or that aspect of the subject which escapes language. To give you an example, one of the novels that I, I use also in my book is by Kishwar Desai, who talks uh, called The Origins of Love. And this is how she describes the reaction of an Indian surrogate mother giving birth to a child that is genetically different from them. She writes, it was all the more difficult when a white, beautiful white baby emerged from between their dusky thighs as though they had given birth to a god or goddess. It was a miracle they would remember for the rest of their lives, and the excitement was palpable. In India, the issue of skin bleaching is huge. Uh, and it's a, it is, a, it is a over a billion dollar industry, and women, are, women and now men are really obsessed with bleaching their skin. And it almost makes me wonder that having a white baby inserted into you, is it about bleaching yourself from the inside out? <clears throat> One of the other things that surrogate mothers often say is they prefer to give birth to white children because it is easier for them to give that child up because it doesn't look like them. But could that be the only reason or is it this underlying desire 
to participate in an empire that has left us physically, but not mentally. When we talk about whiteness, we have to talk about the ways in which language seems to play. In the infancy narrative, it's the angelic emissary of the Hebrew God who speaks Greek, one of the two official languages of the Roman Empire to the Palestinian peasant woman. Mary responds in Greek rather than in Aramaic, and her womb is infiltrated by the child of the divine other. In the contemporary post-colonial Indian context, it's an Indian doctor who speaks English, the language of the former colonizer who infiltrates the womb of the Indian woman and plants the fertilized egg of the racial other, the Western couple. <clears throat> Manjula, who is a 30-year-old surrogate mother, says she has a son and two daughters of her own, and she is carrying a child for profit. And she, and she gives the report of the reason. The first time I came and I became a surrogate, I made a house. Now I have come for my daughter. I have to educate her. I have to get her married. I want to teach my daughter computers. I want to have them educated, get them married to a nice boy. Basanti, who's another surrogate mother, who says, um, in India, families are close. You are ready to do anything for your children. To see my children get everything I ever dreamt of, that's why I became a surrogate. She is pregnant, not with her own child, but a child of a Japanese couple. And she will get paid $8,000, enough to build a new house and send her two children, aged five and seven, to an English-speaking school, something she never thought was possible. Many of the interviews, the surrogate mothers talk about educating their children but not just any education, educating them in English. Because English, as we have all been taught, growing up in a post-colonial context, English, when spoken and placed on the lips of a post-colonial subject, creates opportunities, allows you to be successful, dreams of opportunities and desires. It is the language of desire. Many surrogate mothers, when talking to the reporters, tell the reporters, we want our children to speak just like you. And where are these children going to go at the end of the day? They're going to get educated in English, move to the city, and work in call centers, and answer phone calls. So are we really that liberated here? And how are we talking about liberation? So <clears throat> when we limit Mary and the Indian surrogate mothers to binary categories, I argue we miss some of the nuances of the written text as well as we miss the nuances of the lived experiences of these women. Yes, these women are liberated women. They transcend and renounce patriarchal power. Yes, they are also empowered mothers because they dare or they have the guts to dream of a better future for their children and their people. But the only way for them to achieve their freedom is through their active consent to being enslaved. And they are exploited. When reading, Luke's Mary alongside and through the body of the Indian surrogate mothers, we are revealed to a power structure that fights to dominate, economize, and control the bodies of women. These women then emerge as gestation sites that produce powerful saviors for the powerful other. They participate in a birth that is based on their choice and this choice to uplift themselves from a lower status and dream of a better future for their children and their people. And they take pride in the fact that they are blessed. They don't apologize for it. They become hybrid bodies. They are enslaved and free at the same time. And they embody a violent love of, surrogate, uh, of surrogacy, a, a, a violent love that problematizes categories of liberation and oppression, and uh, uh, categories that have been used to define and constrict these women into victims or heroes. So then, how do we understand Mary in light of this? She performs a maternal love that is violent and loving. And it's her willingness and their willingness to accept an oppressive liberation 
that drives both these mothers to open up their bodies for exploitation and violence. It is the love that they feel for their children and for their people. It is also the love that they feel for the infertile other or the divine other and the divine other. It is the desire for a better life, the desire to belong, the desire to please the other and the desire ultimately to become divine that impels these women to engage in a maternal subjectivity, a motherhood that never fully enslaves or never fully emancipates them. In the end, these women perform a violent love, an oppressive liberation that leaves them as victimized heroes. Yes, they're heroes, but they're also victims. Standing up between categories of oppression and liberation, open, violated, and incomplete, waiting for the material hope that is now embedded in their bodies to be realized before their eyes. Reading Mary alongside Indian surrogate mothers. Thank you. Well, So, thank you very much. Very provocative and informative. Thank you. <coughs> what about the religious interpretation in Indian culture mm -hmm. about the act of being a surrogate mother? So, you have the economic language, the transactional language. Is that, so, what are some of the religious uh, understanding mm -hmm. if these women have revealed that in interviews. Yes, yes. Uh, because it's one cultural dimension, is it right, that could also be correlated right. in terms of the religious text that you are exploring. Right, right. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, one of the things that I have explored in my own, uh, in my own book is the way in which um, these women talk about Krishna and Lord Krishna. And that becomes their reference point of why they think Performing surrogacy is a divine thing. So if you're, not, if you're familiar with the story of Krishna, Krishna is um, an incarnation of Vishnu. And when he is born to his parents, his parents are put in jail. Um, but when he is born, the gods are on the side of Krishna. His life is under threat. This is going to sound very similar to the Hebrew Bible. You know, there's rain and there are floods. And the, 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 the gates of the prison open, and um, his father, Krishna's father, puts the baby in a basket and takes, takes him to his friend's house. And Krishna grows up with Yashoda. Yashoda is not Krishna's biological mother. She is his adopted mother. And yet, whenever you talk about stories of Krishna, you talk about stories of Krishna and Yashoda not his own biological mother, Devaki. And so these surrogate mothers see their role as Yashoda. Except in the story, Krishna grows up with Yashoda. In the, in, in the real life stories, they never get to see their own children. But that's the way they see themselves doing the work of God, right? And that's how they're recruited. They're recruited as doing something noble. They're not, they're, you're not doing this for money. You're doing this. Money is an incentive, but you're doing something noble. You're giving life to these people. Think how difficult it is with infertility. Think about this is, you know, they use the story of Krishna and Yashoda to get it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for, Thank you. Um, I've not been aware of this. And it made me think about the movie um, Fiddle on the Roof in which the hero Tevye says, um, if, the, if the rich could afford it, they would get the poor to die for them. Mm. Um, so <laughs> um, I'm curious about the family life. So these women, this is a practical question. Are they then taken to um, like a hospital and they have to stay there for the whole time? Mm -hmm. And what happens to the family life um, 
since they're away from the family, how, how were they seen when they returned? I'm curious about yeah, things like yeah. that. Yeah, what a great question. And um, that was something that really shocked me, right? Um, first of all, most of these women who sign up to be surrogates are women who are doing it on the, you know, very quietly. Because there is a lot of, um, you say, a lot of mis mis misrepresentations, misunderstandings about the surrogacy industry. First of all, what do you mean that you didn't have to sleep with somebody and have a child? That doesn't happen. And you're married, but the child doesn't look like you. So they often will leave their home, hometown and go to the, to the bigger cities or wherever the surrogate clinics are. Once they sign up to be a surrogate, then they, these women move into the hostels where they live with other women who are also pregnant. And their families will either stay there uh, but, or will go back. But the families are not allowed to come and meet the, meet the surrogate mothers, for the most part. Sometimes if it's a festival or something, they're allowed. So the women actually kind of, it's, it's almost like a room, you know, and you saw that happening over there. They're called surrogate hostels, where these women stay. They are given, uh, so given medicine, good food to eat, and they, you know, they go through this whole pregnancy by themselves with other women. It's almost like a community. Uh, that is formed, but um, many of these women also have young children, and you know the young child is not able to understand why mom has to go and live somewhere else. But that's that's the practical, you know, question. You have do you have a follow up? Or? No, good. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. I was just wondering about the interviews. Um, if you could answer this question based on additional interviews that we didn't mention. And that is the women are very clear about the benefits that they will receive from the money. But is there ever a sense of, wouldn't it be nice if I didn't have to do this mm -hmm. in order to educate my child to buy a house? Yeah. Yes, and that comes through in like what uh, some of the surrogates says. Salma is one of them who says, I don't want to do this. I'm doing it because it's a compulsion. I'm doing it because if I don't do this, my child is not going to get educated. So um, if they had the means, they wouldn't, right? And, and, that's the, and that's the sticky spot. At the same time, one of the things I tried to do in my work was not judge these women in any way. Uh, and, and call them, uh, you know, being exploited or victimize them in any way. But rather to just say the situation is so complex that the only way for them to dream of a future for their child is to violate themselves, they'll do it, right? Wouldn't parents do that, right? So it's, it's that, right? Does, uh, does that help answer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes? What about the possibility of the surrogate having multiple children and this, the, the people that asked for it want one, what happens to the rest? Yeah, and that, you brought up a really good point because um, this is where, you know, India is trying very hard now to propose a ban. And this is happening as we speak. They're trying to ban the surrogate industry movement because it's, they're basing it on exploitation. And one of the reasons for that is because the last slide that I showed you um, this is a child of a, of a, of a Thai, Thailand, Thai mother who gave birth to twins. One of the child was born with Down syndrome. The parents of that child did not want the child with Down syndrome and they took the healthy baby away. And the, ch the woman already had children, so she didn't know what to do with the child. And so these, there, were, there have been multiple cases that have happened with that. So um, to reduce that, India has now come up with a ban that they're proposing where, there's, where they want to say that we're going to only allow surrogacy for people within India to take part, of, part in it. Um, if you ask me, for my personal opinion, that doesn't solve the problem. Uh, or, um, and also, you know, you have to be married to a woman, so gay and, gay and lesbian couples are not allowed to partake in surrogacy. Uh, and if they really want to do surrogacy, then they need to have a relative. So in those cases, um, we don't know what to do with the child. In addition to that, there's a huge problem with citizenship. 
right? Because this child is born in India, but has genetic parents. Now we talk about post-colonial subjectivity here, right? But has parents that are of a different, uh, holding different passports and citizens of a different country. What is the citizenship of this child? Is this child Japanese? Is this child American? Is this child Indian? And our, what is the uh, citizenship of this child? And so that begins to you know, really make this whole process complex. Uh, in the end, they did end up adopting this child. But um, for the longest time, it was just complete chaos. Because nobody wanted this child. Yeah. Yes, Toa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is a great, I have not thought about that, I have to be honest, that's a great question. But um, one of the ways I can, uh, I think it would help me think about, maybe then, and that's book project number two, right, uh, would be to think about it in the way that this idea, we often when we talk about categories of liberation and oppression, and that's always been my issue, is that we talk about it as two separate categories. But recognizing that there, there's much more blurred um, overlap, there is, it's much more complex than just talking about, you know, uh, <clears throat> violence, but to talk about it as, you know, violence for a greater cause, does that make it right or wrong? So that's the way I would answer it. But I don't know if anybody else wants to, yeah, and enter that conversation. Yes. Yes. The oldest, oh yeah, the Syrian women. Um, I don't know that yet. I, in fact, actually, Rangachari Smirden is, is working on her next article or book that talks about the post-colonial subjectivity of these children and waiting to see once they grow old, would they, would they consider themselves Indian citizens, you know? And there's one more, there's one more thing that is really neat and, and that's something that I don't talk about in my own, uh, that I talk about in my book, but I didn't talk about it here, is the way in which um, the commissioning parents, the, the clinics are all trying very hard to control the womb, right? And yet, there are moments where there is slippage happening constantly. For those of us who've had children will know this, right? Um, I often wonder, will these children go, grow up with a higher tolerance for spicy food? You know? Or maybe vegetarian, or may have a greater affinity to language. Because there are parts that no matter how much you try to control this womb, there are moments that slip right through. And you can put them in a hospital, you can put them in a hostel, and yet there are moments that you just cannot control between these two. So I would be very interested to see if these children would just enjoy eating Indian food, you know? So, yeah. Well, thank you. Um, would you please um, help me? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Thank you.